Tonight, we have the great privilege of having Dr. Miroslav Volf here with us to help us think about one of the greatest challenges of our era, which is how do we live faithfully as Christians in a pluralistic society, particularly thinking about the issue of the relationship between Christians and Muslims. So he's going to talk about his book, Allah, A Christian Response, tonight. Dr. Volf is the Henry Wright Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School. I've had the privilege of working with him on a project called Faith as a Way of Life, and it is a tremendous privilege for us to have him here with us. Let me direct your attention to the fact there are two microphones on either side of the aisle here. After Dr. Volf speaks, uh, he's going to open up the floor and take questions from you. Please make your questions questions uh, or your comments brief ones so that we can all have a great conversation tonight. And let's begin that conversation by welcoming Dr. Volf. Thank you, Vince. Um, it's great to be here with you. Thank you for your hospitality. Um, it's great to be here at Wheaton. It, you know, first time I've heard of Wheaton was while I was a 15-year-old kid in former Yugoslavia. My then-to-be brother-in-law had studied at Wheaton, um, got his MA in textual criticism with Gordon Fee uh, here, and um, uh, my brother-in-law was um, profoundly influential in my own intellectual uh, life, and hence Wheaton has had uh, impact on me, and so I'm delighted to be here. Some of my great friends um, are both graduates and teachers here, so it's with great pleasure that I'm here. Um, Christianity and Islam, God of Jesus Christ and the God of Muhammad, relationship between these two, some aspect of this relationship is our topic for tonight. Now, the issue about which I will be speaking is not whether Muslims will or will not go to heaven. That's a very important question that people often ask and want pursued. I will bracket it completely tonight. My question tonight is this one. How can Muslims and Christians, who comprise more than half of humanity, how can they live together in a single world? Now, this question is important for us, I think, partly because we live in an interconnected and even more importantly, highly interdependent world. We also are, because we are interdependent, profoundly intertwined as well. And as it happens, we live in the era of both growing and assertive religions, publicly assertive religions. Intertwined with assertive religions, that some people think is a recipe for conflict. And indeed, in many parts of the world, it has been a source of significant conflict. Now, some people have hoped that we would be able to, they would be able to, rather, eliminate religion, if not completely, then certainly as a factor in public life. That clearly has not succeeded, and if one tries to do that, I think the result would be increased oppression and violence, rather than in any way decreased. Another project was to try to sequester religious groups the traditionally cuius regio, eus religio, whose rule that once religion also will be the dominant one. That has been tried as well, but in uh, the context of an interdependent, intertwined world, uh, that is a non-starter. There may be some religiously pure areas in the world today, but increasingly they're disappearing. We are intertwined. And also, some people have tried to kind of lock the faith in the privacy of worshipers' hearts. 
um, and not let it come to uh, have a public expression, that too has uh, failed. And partly it's failed, it's failing because majority of religious people, and that's true of Muslims, some people, some Christians are surprised at that, but the majority of people, uh, religious people in the world, embrace democratic ideal. Now, if you embrace the democratic ideal and you belong to one of the prophetic faiths, one of the faiths which demands of its worshipers, of its followers, to shape the world in the light of God's revelation, if you believe, if you belong to one of those prophetic faiths, what will you do if you embrace democracy as an ideal? Well, you will have your faith, uh, you will attempt at least to have your faith shape the public realm. So we live together, uh, commun religious communities intertwined uh, together and with assertive uh, religions. How will we live together? I think we can live together only if we have some common set of values. And that's where the question of whether Muslims and Christians believe in the same God becomes one of the major, broadly speaking, one of the major political questions. Why? Because if you are a monotheist, as Christians and Muslims are, then your ultimate values are all embodied in that God whom you worship. And those ultimate and fundamental values, if they clash, if you don't worship the same God, if you worship radically different gods, then your fundamental values will clash. And likelihood that in an interdependent world with assertive religions we are able to live together is relatively small. My question then is, is it true that Muslims and Christians worship a different God, or is it rather true that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, though understood in partly different ways? And my argument is Muslims and Christians do worship the same God, partly differently understood. I'll try to explicate that a little bit later on, but I put it there as a thesis at the very beginning, I know you'll come back at me and we'll discuss that. And um, if everything else failed, you can read my book and then come back to me again. But uh, for now, let me, let me continue and the question and answer period will, will deal with any concerns that you might have. How to live together in a common world. Now, in May of 2005, it was a decade after the war ended in Bosnia. I come from former Yugoslavia. I followed the war in Bosnia very, uh, very carefully. Um, I returned back to one of the conferences Muslim Christian, uh, about Muslim-Christian relations, Building Bridges conferences, and we were discussing the topic Muslims and Christians and the common good, right in the middle of Sarajevo, after about 10 years after Sarajevo, uh, after the war in former Yugoslavia. Um, meetings as they were going on, <laughs> discussions about these, these issues, meeting the dignitaries of all three of uh, faiths, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, Muslim, all of this weighed too heavily on me. And so I sought solace uh, in, in, a, a, in a friendship with my very good Franciscan, uh, Franciscan friend, who's a Franciscan theologian. And I went out uh, with him for dinner. And as we were returning back in the evening, uh, we were discussing uh, the topic of, uh, of our conference, uh, Muslims and Christians and the, common, uh, and the common good. We're walking through the streets of Sarajevo and he tells me very abruptly, surprisingly, he said, we have lost the fear of God. And I think, okay, Ivo, what has fear of God to do with the common good? Now, by fear of God, he didn't mean a kind of a constraining sense that all our moves must be approved by some over overbearing potentate. He meant something, uh, a relationship in which we give to God ultimate allegiance in that God is that one who fundamentally and ultimately matters to us. So fear of God. He said then to me, new mosques, are springing left and right, 
and the old ones are being restored to new glory. Largely, he said, this is not a revival of deep spirituality seeking spaces for outward expression and nurture. These building projects are political acts. Muslims are asserting their identity and marking their territory. The war with guns and tanks is over. The war with religious symbols has begun. As I was listening to this, I thought, wow. Sacred objects as weapons in secular struggles. Struggles for territory, right? Struggles for domination. Now, if anything is secularization of religion, that's what secularization of religion is. Employment of religion for utterly secular purposes. Won't take long before the mask of religion will be taken. You'll see it as a naked grab for power for what it actually is. As I was thinking about that, I thought also, well, and I told him, Evo, but we Christians aren't much better, are we? And I was thinking not so much of Sarajevo, but of another city, a little bit south of Mostar. And the city of Mostar, city where I lived for a whole year, Catholics who dominated the, the city have built a hundred foot cross on the mountain overlooking the valley in which the city was. At night it is lit and it is the same spot from which Muslims were shelled during the war was now dominated by that cross. So again, a religious symbol as a weapon in struggles. And my friend responded, Franciscan friend responded, well, Miroslav, you make my point. Christians and Muslims alike use sacred objects to occupy spaces and celebrate their own identities. And then he said, they do so because they fear each other, but they don't fear God. Religion is a marker of identity. That religion has swallowed up allegiance to the one God, and I would say to the one common God. And even though God is on everyone's lips, religion has become godless. Maybe religion has become godless because God is on everyone's lips. Once you talk too much about God, I begin to be suspicious. Now that's from, from a person who is a deeply committed orthodox Christian. Each community thinks only of its own injuries, of its own hopes, pursuing only its own interests and its own good, neither cares for the other, nor from the common good. How can we care for the common good if we don't worship, if we don't give allegiance to something or someone who is common to us both? The fear of God, it says in the wisdom literature, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God, I think my friend suggested, is the beginning of the political wisdom, of our ability to live together in a multi-religious state. Now, as he was talking about the fear of God and the importance of the fear of God, and as he was kind of tearing down Islam and Christianity as religions, don't misunderstand me, it's not as allegiance to God, but as kind of religious edifices, I thought immediately of a great 20th century theologian, Karl Barth. He began his career by rebelling against religion, not against God, against religion. What kind of religion? Religion reduced to culture, to a certain kind of morality 
religious and twisted into a kind of cultural resource, a marker of group identity. He was a Swiss village pastor. And his rebellion against religion turned him into a world-class theologian. Well, not just that, right? But that, especially. What happened? In August 1914, German Kaiser Wilhelm declared war on Russia and France. He asked the great liberal theologian, Adolf Harnack, some of you have read some of Harnack's works, I, uh, I assume, here. He asked Adolf von Harnack to help him draft a speech addressed to the German nation after the beginning of the war. Harnack complied. Later, along with another liberal theologian by the name of Wilhelm Hermann, Harnack also signed this famous petition of 93 leading German intellectuals in support of the German cause. German militarism is a protector of German culture, they declare. In the land of Kant, Goethe, and Beethoven, freedom and culture will thrive only if it doesn't shy away from using, only if the nation doesn't shy away from using its weapons. Both Harnack and, Bar, uh, and Her Herman were Bart's teachers. Bart was a Swiss citizen. He had a bit of distance from the German insanity. And he thought that the Christian faith of his great teachers is nothing but a Christianized version of German culture and of Enlightenment morality. It's now turned aggressive. He rejected it as mere religion. By mere religion, he meant self-aggrandizing and dangerous betrayal of the true faith, parading as the gold standard of morality and enlightened religiosity. What's at the heart of the true faith for Karl Barth? It's the fear of the Lord. The Bible has only one all-encompassing interest, he argued, and that is the interest in God himself. He put it very simply, God is God. You can't say it more simply than that, right? God is God. God alone is God. And therefore, God demands our entire obedience. God, Bart insisted, cannot be grasped, brought under management, or put to use. Now that was essential for him. God cannot, ought not, be put to use. He cannot serve. God cannot serve. God must rule. When you read his texts, and if you forget about the cultural background and political background in which he is writing, you might think that Bart's turn to God was utterly otherworldly, detached from history, culture, politics, and from the common good. And yet, it was not. It was a battle cry against the idol of religion and the world for which it provides a sacred canopy. World of group identities, national interest, a group of, uh, um, uh, a world of cleansed territories, a world of exclusion, world of enmities and aggression. When the idol of religion is smashed and God acknowledged as God, what happens to the world? Well, it appears as a unity and then the search for the common good can begin. This is about, we live about a century after Barth's initial battle cry. And Muslims and Christians today may be in somewhat similar situation as Barth was during World War I. The thunder of wars in which Muslims and Christians are involved continues unabated, and tensions between the two run high in the West as well as in the majority Muslim countries. Religious leaders and combatants both invoke religion 
in support their of their cause. The terrorists who flew planes into the Twin Towers were instructed in their manual, remember, this is a battle for the sake of God. For the influential, well, maybe not anymore, but then influential TV evangelist and former presidential candidate Pat Robertson, the whole conflict between Islam and the West is the contest whether the moon god of Mecca known as Allah is supreme or whether Judeo-Christian Jehovah, the god of the Bible, is supreme. Now, not all talk about God is really talk about God. Some of it is false. Some of it is about false gods, and much of it is about culture, territory, and identity, and much of it is therefore very deeply divisive and dangerous. And I think Christians and Muslims can both rebel against such misuse of the name of God and unite together in the fear of God. Maybe that might open up the possibility for them, for us, to pursue something like the common good or simply to be able to live together under the common roof. Now, you will say everything that I've said so far presupposes, in fact, that they do, that Muslims and Christians do worship the same God. But is it true that they worship the same God? Um, I'll offer only brief uh, comments about uh, this. Uh, maybe if you want further exploration, we can talk uh, during the question and answer period. Now, my argument is relatively simple in this regard. I distinguish between uh, referent, God as referent of our language, and the description of that referent, description of who God is. And if you ask me, do Muslims and Christians have the same object in mind when they refer to God? I think the answer to this question is an unambiguous yes. They have exactly the same object in mind. Why? Well, because Muslims and Christians, just about all Muslims and Christians, believe that, one, God has created the world. By the world, Muslims and Christians mean everything else that is not God. Right? God created everything else that exists that is not God. God is one. And God can in no way be identified or confused with the world. It is not that somehow a world emerges out of God's, uh, as kind of God's body, right? God is distinct, categorically even distinct from the world. Now, I think if you affirm these three claims, Muslims and Christians do, I think you have to say something like this. If God were an object, to whom you could point. We know that God isn't such an object, or at least theologians tell us that God isn't such an object. Um, do you doubt that? <laughs> footnote. <laughs> lectures have footnotes, right? If papers have footnotes, lectures have footnotes too. So footnote. Why is it that we cannot point to God? Not because God is really, really far away, and so when we point, we don't see anything but fundamentally because God is categorically different than the world. God is not an object in this world. One of my colleagues, Dennis Turner, has said, well, imagine somebody, somebody has this crazy experiment. He's going to or she's going to enumerate all different things that exist in the world. And let's say that all the number of all these different things that exist in the world is n. And then somebody says to that person, well, wait a second, you've forgotten one very, very important fact in the world, and that's God. And now that person says, aha, no, I've, I've gotten the number wrong. Number is n plus one, right? That's not how it works, because God is not part of the world, categorically different. 
Therefore, we cannot really point to God. End of my footnote, back to the main text we go. Okay. <laughs> now, if we could point to God, if Muslims and Christians could point to God, there would be only one and only one object they could point to if they have these three, share these three convictions. And that is that one to whom we refer when we speak about God. Now, so that's the question about the referent for God. Now, the, the important question is also about the description of God. Well, you may say it's very well that the referent of our language about God is the same, but is the description of that God the same too? And here the answer is a bit more complicated. And the answer goes something like that. The description is sufficiently similar. In both tradition, God is moral character of God is not the same, but it's sufficiently similar. God is just and God is merciful. God commands roughly in both tradition for us to obey 10 commandments. No, it's really nine commandments because the command, Sabbath command is not enjoined either in Quran or in the Bible. Christians at least don't think that they need to necessarily follow it. So nine commands are the same, right? Well, if we, come, we have some, some of our Christian reasons for it, right? It's not just arbitrary that we decided we don't want to uh, obey this seventh uh, command, right? So, so my, my suggestion is, well, that then the, the character description of God is sufficiently similar. Now, some of you might say, now, that, that's not quite enough. And one, per, one person put its uh, argument against the position like I'm advocating like this. So with God, it is like with money. If you have two banknotes, and you know which one's genuine, right? And the other one just slightly is different than the genuine one, then you'll know that you have a counterfeit money, right? And he said, well, that's exactly how it is with God. If the picture of God only slightly differs from the one that we have in the Bible, the God whom Jesus has revealed, the God, that God or God, must be a false God. I think that's a wrong kind of an argument because God is not like a banknote. I think we have to in, instead operate with the principle of sufficient similarity. Now, my argument, or my statement rather right now, is that there is sufficient similarity between Muslims and Christian conceptions of God so that we can say that they worship the same and similarly understood God, which provides the basis, I think, for some of mo very significant common values. It doesn't mean that there'll be agreement. It means that there's a basis on which possible agreement can be reached. Right? Let me now make a few more comments, and then I will uh, open the floor for discussion. Uh, for Christians, certainly, the issue is not simply rightly identifying God, knowing rightly who it is that God is. For Christians, fundamental question is also worshiping God and worshiping God rightly. I take it that it's uncontested that um, in the Christian tradition, we worship God in two ways, by loving God and by loving our neighbors. Loving our neighbors is a mode of worship of that God. Why? Because this is God's command. It's more complicated than that, but basically it boils down to this. So you worship God in what you do, how you live in the world. All right? Now, this is a preliminary comment. Now, um, during the Cold War, when I was growing up in the former Yugoslavia, there was a, there was a debate going on between communism and Christianity, right? That was a big struggle that was going on. And within that struggle, uh, one of the French philosophers, Christian philosophers, has come up with a distinction between theoretical atheists and practical atheists. Now, we all know what theoretical atheists are. Those are the folks who have as their responsible intellectual position uh, denial that God exists. Now, what is a practical atheist? 
Well, practical atheist is the one who affirms that God's, uh, God exists, but in the way in which they live, they actually deny God. They live as if there were no God. They deny God's commandments, right? They say then that they worship God, but in fact, they do not. Now, you remember prophets have railed against this kind of religiosity, um, fasting, uh, prayers, uh, take them away, the noise of your prayers from me, let justice roll, right? Uh, God cannot be worshipped properly with our prayers unless God is worshipped in our deeds. Now Jesus has given a kind of twist to that idea. You remember that Jesus said, you cannot worship God and mammon. It's not just now, he says, that you can do all the outward rituals, but in fact not worship God, which is what the prophet says. You actually, when you, you can actually worship something else than God, while at the same time claiming that you worship God, right? You can worship money, you can worship nation, whatever else. And Martin Luther picked up the idea and suggested, well, what is God? God is that in which you place your trust. That is your God. That's who you worship. No matter what you say with your mind, with your mouth, what your profession is, your action tell us what it is that you actually place your trust in, what is it that you actually worship. It's a practical worship of God. Now all of this, I said, in order to give you a historical contrast, background for a historical contrast. And the historical contrast that I want to draw for you concerns the crusade. In uh, 1099, June of 1099, Jerusalem was captured by crusaders. And it happened on noonday hour on Friday, the day of the week when Christ redeemed the whole world on the cross. Crusaders took Jerusalem and butchered all of Jerusalem inhabitants. Here is a report by a Christian. Nowhere was there a place where Muslims could escape the swordsmen. Not even in Solomon's temple. And then he continues. On the top of Solomon's temple, to which they had climbed in fleeing, many were shot to death with arrows and cast down headlong from the roof. Within this temple, about 10,000 were beheaded. If you had been there, your feet would have been stained up to the ankles with the blood of the slain. What more shall I tell? Not one of them was allowed to live. They did not spare women and children. Now, you can put next to this scene of cruel crusaders from the Middle Ages, uh, you can imagine a contemporary scene, a Muslim terrorist blowing himself up to kill and maim the innocent and spread uncertainty and fear. Are the crusaders and the terrorists Worshipping the same God. Crusader shouts, Christ is the Lord, and cleaves the head of the infidel. A terrorist, Muslim terrorist, shouts, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest, and he pulls the fuse of the bomb strapped around his waist. They're naming God very differently. And yet they are, I think, 
worshiping the same God, a bloodthirsty God of power, not the God of justice and mercy of the normative Christian and Muslim religious traditions. Now, when it comes to practices, the fundamental issue is not whether Muslims and Christians believe and worship the same God. It is whether they worship the true God. One more twist to, it, to this, as if this was not challenging enough, and then I will end. If you return to Jerusalem about 100 years later, struggles of Christians and Muslims for rule over Jerusalem were going on. In 1187, the Muslim ruler, ruler Salah ad-Din, or Saladin, recaptured Jerusalem. Now, unlike the Crusaders a century earlier, he spared the inhabitants' lives. He offered safe passage with all their possessions to those who could pay a ransom. 10 dinars for males, five dinars for females, too bad for your girls, <laughs> didn't work quite as well, one for children. Those who could not pay ransom were less fortunate. They became booty and could be killed. Now it's interesting, commenting on Saladin's offer, a Christian eyewitness writes, this agreement pleased the Lord Patriarch and the others who had money. Right? Those who had money, they could leave. But what about those who did not have money? Crowds, there's a report, crowds throughout the city wailed in sorrowful tones. Woe, woe to us, miserable people, we have no gold. What are we to do? Now significantly, the anger of the poor was not directed against Saladin, but against their wealthy Christians who could not help their poor core religionists. The same report, Christian report, writes, Alas, by hands of wicked Christians, Jerusalem was turned over to the wicked. Now, these wicked Christians looked even worse after Saladin, their enemy and conqueror, released 1,000 of the poor residents without ransom. I can assure you that Saladin did not believe that God was the Holy Trinity. I can assure you that he did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and it's unlikely that he believed that Jesus Christ died for the sin of the world, as we Christians rightly do. But I ask you, might he not have been with his deeds worshiping the one true God better than did the Crusaders when they butchered all the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm to invite you all, uh, or whoever has question to, or comment, to come. There are two microphones. Please feel free. We have some uh, um, 40 minutes, almost, uh, for interaction. So. I know there are comments. I'm, I'm sure there are. <laughs> I'm on without this mic, right? Like this? Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> Professor Bolt, thank you. Um, I want to start with Bart, where you started with, where, and, and Bart's own correction, or at least his comments on his initial early phase, which you were rightly talking about, where he, in the Romans period, the early period, distanced God from the world in order to protect against making God uh, subject to the world. 
later on, he, he issued kind of a correction where he said, and I'm thinking of the humanity of God, that essay, where he says, I was right then, but I was wrong only to say that. I also had to talk about God's nearness, that I, had, I didn't know the true God until I knew that he had come to us, which is a, really a comment about God coming, about the particularity of Christian revelation, that a Christian confesses that with, you know, Philip asks Jesus, show us the Father, and Jesus, John 14, 8 and 9 says, um, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, that you start with Jesus Christ, and you start with the crucified God. Um, and that um, it's, I, I give you a chance to comment on, if you start with the fear of God, you're starting in some sense from below. You're starting with your perspective and your idea of God as you're encountering God. And you can find commonality with someone else. But if you start with from, from above, with the God from above to below, the God of the Jewish man coming in Jesus, crucified God, that we see in scripture, um, how can you then start and connect with the God of Allah who was not crucified? Th thank you for this uh, question. Um, uh, Christians, any Christian, adequate Christian account of who God is has to include and has to go through the self-revelation of that God in Jesus Christ. God incarnate in Jesus Christ, in the story of Jesus Christ, including death and resurrection. Um, that's normative for, for Christians. Does it therefore follow that Let's stay with the, with the Christian Bible. Does it therefore follow that the Jews who did not worship, who did not come to know, those Jews, let's put it this way, who did not come to know God through Jesus Christ, therefore did not worship the same God? And I think overwhelming answer of the New Testament, overwhelming answer of the whole of the Christian tradition was that the Jews then and throughout history worshiped the same God, differently understood, but the same God as the Christians do. Now, Jews had slightly different opinion about that, right? Uh, because Christians introduced a Trinitarian conception of God, but Christians never thought the Jews, only heretical Christians did, but Orthodox Christians never thought the Jews worshiped a different God. Now, I'd suggest that there's, something, that there's an analogy um, to how we should assess um, the account that Muslims, that in Quran we have of God. There are differences, but there is an analogy, which is to say we come to know who God is through Jesus Christ, we know characteristics and features and uh, the attributes of God, and then we look and compare. Is there sufficient similarity? A similarity of the kind that is not radically different than the similarity between account that Christians give of God, of God and, for instance, Jewish accounts of God. And once we do that, I think you come with the, with the overwhelming sense that if you say that Jews and Christians worship the same God, it is very difficult to make an argument that Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God. All the objections that Muslims have against Christians, Jews have against Christians, all the differences, virtually all the differences, which um, Christians have with the Jews, Jewish account of God, they have also with Muslim account of God, I suggest those are par parallels, and therefore we ought to embrace the idea that Muslims and Christians, notwithstanding the fact of the ultimate revelation of God in Jesus Christ, worship the same God. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much um, for your desire for um, us to embrace and uh, for love and uh, for reconciliation. Um, I just want to ask, um, because I think we can learn a lot from history. 
um, is Arius and Athanasius worshiping the same God? Um, and um, if they are, how, and what is the difference if they're not? Yeah, I would make an argument that Arius and Athanasius refer to the same God. That they, that they, they characterize the God in a different, different way. Um, but that they worshiped the same God. You know, with, um, if you start parsing it out, compare uh, Arius and Athanasius, uh, compare for me um, Athanasius and Irenaeus, uh, Justin Martyr, for instance. And uh, I'm not sure that you wouldn't say that Justin Martyr then didn't worship the same God as Athanasius and so forth, right? That you wouldn't have Trinitarian, full-blown Trinitarianism, you wouldn't find in some of these uh, thinkers, right? Early thinkers. And then you would have to say, well, they worshipped a different God. Uh, I don't think that's the adequate conclusion. M m my sense also is, okay, let's put it this way. I sit at the table with my nine-year-old son, Aaron, and we pray. Um, or when he was three, God is great and God is good, and we thank God for our food, right? So God is great and God is good, I say, and God is great and God is good, Aaron says. If I could to tease out what he means by that, uh, we'd end up, if really not worshiping the same God. His understanding of God is a very limited one. I would propose we have the same referent, mine, but not the same description. Professor Wolf, uh, thank you again. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, the first is, um, it's certainly true that Christians do not have a monopoly on good or virtuous deeds. Um, but uh, as a clarification, or, or um, wondering uh, for a clarification, if we understand worship, um, not knowledge, or not belief in, but, but worship of the true God um, as being based off of deeds, um, in your view, do, does that include um, those of other faiths, including Buddhism, um, Hinduism, atheism, or is it contingent upon belief in a monotheistic deity. Second question, um, is there anything distinctive about Christian ethics? Well, second question is yes. Uh, the answer to the second question is there is something very distinctive about uh, Christian ethics. Um, there's something very distinctive about Christian way of, way of life. And that which is distinctive about Christian way of life, I. Um, I not only happily embrace, but I think that it is the most beautiful expression of what it truly means to be a human and live in response to who God is. I think one of the, one of the great convictions of the Christian faith, um, if you ask me kind of intellectual reason almost, or moral reason why I'm a Christian, I would say because the Christian faith in a unique way, claims that God is love. Not that God loves simply, but that God is love. And God's being love, when facing the world of sin, translates into God giving God's own self for the salvation of humankind. And for us, it means following in the footsteps of the crucified. For us, it means giving allegiance to that God in that we love our enemies, or at least seek to love our enemies. So that the connection between God's being love, self-giving of God on the cross, and the way of life and ethics, as you would describe, moral life of Christians is very, very tight. Uh, I think these are distinctive and fundamental convictions for the Christian faith. And when I say distinctive, I don't mean that other people cannot emulate them, and other people cannot 
um, embrace them, embrace them even with their own uh, resources. I'm not really interested in somebody being different than I am, right? I'm not interested in somebody saying that you shouldn't love their enemies, or, uh, your enemies, right? I'm interested in everybody embracing it. If you embrace it as a, uh, as a Buddhist, great. If you embrace it as an atheist, great. If you embrace it as a Muslim, great also. Why? Because this is what God wants us to do. I don't want to identify myself by my difference. I want to identify myself by the center of my faith. Right? Um, but if you ask, are there differences, distinctions? Yeah, I would, I would say there are. Uh, first question, what was the first question? Uh, Remind me, jog my... In worship, ah, yeah. the, the one true God is based on, or uh, recognized in our deeds. Um, do those of other faiths not, that don't believe in a monotheistic God Well, we, we, we'd, have to, we'd have to parse that out. If somebody, if somebody says that doing certain deeds, say if a monotheist says that doing certain deeds is in a response to God, right? I would certainly then want to argue they are in those deeds explicitly worshiping God, right? Uh, again, uh, just keep in mind, uh, I'm bracketing the question of salvation <laughs> completely. Uh, this is not about salvation. It's about our life in the world. Now, how would we deal with folks who do not believe in God and therefore explicitly do not, in their deeds which we affirm, worship God, render God uh, worship? It may be open for discussion. I, I don't necessarily want to, uh, want to argue about it either way. I could have my opinion, but it doesn't profoundly affect uh, the, the point that I'm making, I think. Comment. Thank you very much. It was really good uh, presentation. Uh, I have some uh, clarifications and then I will ask you a question. About Shabbat, you know, I'm Muslim Imam of the Glen Mosque, Glen Allen Mosque here. <clears throat> and I was very excited about your presentation today. Thank you very much. Uh, the Shabbat, we understand Shabbat means to reserve one day or one part of the day. We Muslim believe that Shabbat is a Friday. So it's not a Saturday, it is a Friday, and we, of course, we have our day, you know, uh, spend it in worship. As the word of Allah is concerned, it is from Aleha Yalaho, which means, which is object and subject, both ways. I'm just explaining to you. It means that Allah is he who loves everyone, and Allah is he who is beloved of everyone. Mm. And God has mentioned very clearly that the personal name of God is Allah, but you may call him with any name you like it. Ayyamma tadu falahul asmaul usna. You may call him with any name you like it. All good names belong to him. So if anyone calls him Jehovah, Yahweh, Creator, uh, God, Almighty God, that is the same God. And Holy Quran has made it very clear uh, in the Holy Quran, which is uh, chapter 29, verse 47. It says, O kulu amanna billazi unzila ilayna wa unzila ilaykum. Wa ilahuna, wa ilahukum wahid, wa nahnu lahu muslimun. <clears throat> and tell them that we believe in that which has been revealed to us and that which has been revealed to you. So whatever has been revealed to the Christians or to the Jews, mm. yes, we do believe in it. And also tell them that our God and your God is one. And to whom, to him we submit. So Thank we you. understand it's the same God as you explained to us. But anyway, what, what the thing is, as you know, the crusaders and Muslim terrorists, we cannot say that because of the crusaders, every Christian is, a, is like crusaders. And the same case is with the Muslims as well. If there are a handful troublemakers in the whole world, one cannot say that every Muslim is like them. There are 1.6 billion Muslims all over the world, out of 6.3 billion. And there are 73 countries where Muslims are in majority. I can tell you they are very peaceful. And it's only a handful of people who are creating the whole problem because the word Islam means peace, in which the name has been given by God, Islam means peace. And 42 times in the Holy Quran has mentioned the word peace. And also mentioned that uh, the Holy Prophet said, Al Muslimu man, Muslim, man salim al Muslimuna min yadahi wa lisanhi. The true Muslim is he from his hand people are saved from his hand and from his tongue. And it also mentioned that, you know, that 
it is your duty, is the duty of each and every Muslim that he should give peace to the others as well. So just I want to make it clear that Muslims are not, every Muslim is not the terrorist, thank, thank and you. Islam does not mean terrorism. Th thank you, I, 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 don't think, uh, I don't think in this audience, and I don't think um, most, uh, most th there are such people, but most Christians would not come near suggesting that every Muslim is a, a Muslim is a, is a terrorist. I think that this distinction is being made and can be, can be made. I think we need to work against uh, prejudices, uh, certainly. Yeah. But um, uh, I'm, I'm very, much, very much hopeful Thank you. That, the, <coughs> that identification between Muslims and terrorists uh, is not the dominant one, just like the other way around, right? The identification yeah. is not. You know, we also suffer as anybody else suffers, you know, that if anything yeah. happens in any body of the world, you know, we condemn whatever is, you know, has taken over. Anyway, mm -hmm. as uh, uh, the, the God is concerned, Jesus, you know, used the word my God and your God. Mm -hmm. So where, you know, Jesus stays when he says my God and your God, if God is the one and he's the almighty, yeah. So where, you know, where Jesus said, when he says, your God and my God, so what is that, uh, you know? Thank you, 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 thank you for your question. Uh, you. Um, my, I mean, the, the different ways in which Christians have responded to this question, differentiation which Jesus makes between, uh, between himself, my God, and your God, right? Um, and certainly Jesus is both divine. Christians believe that Jesus is both divine and human. And Jesus, at least one interpretation, says Jesus is speaking in the virtue of his own human nature, not denying his own divinity. Uh, after all, you see, it's not just that Jesus says that, Jesus prays to the Father, right? Prayer to the Father means simply, can only mean that someone prays who is not God to God, right? Somebody in virtue of them be not being God is praying to God meaning that Jesus, in the virtue of his humanity, prays to God while at the same time saying that that one with whom, to whom I, in the virtue of my humanity, pray, with that one, in the virtue of my divinity, I'm one with. And that's exactly the function of the dual nature of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Um, earlier you mentioned, of course, the uh, problematic aspect of the the Trinity, and you just recently referred to the deity of Christ. And I want to recommend a clear, a further elaboration. I almost hate to say this: a Christian magazine. It's not the Christi Christianity Today; it's Christian Century uh, here at Wheaton. But uh, your recent uh, article on the March 8th issue. Some of the objections, which I'm sure we all do when we think of the Trinity, and I love the way in which you put these objections forth. Because I started going, to think, yeah, I, have, I, on the face of it, prima facie, I have that objection too, but I believe by faith because it's in the scripture. And after I've been a believer and thought about it, I do have certain philosophical understandings of why God would be Trinitarian. But I love this approach and I recommend it, by the way, in the recent Christianity Day, Allah and the Trinity. It's, it's, a, it's a helpful way, if you could elaborate on this too, to broach the topic in a non-confrontational uh, manner, because first of all, it's, it's difficult for most of us when we're honest. We say mystery, and, which we believe by faith. But if, could you comment on this approach, which I think sure. is good? Actually, sure. Uh, it, it's an excerpt actually from the book a lot, so it's uh, okay. you can get it in Christian Century, and you can get it in the in the book itself. Um, you know, my sense was this is one of the divisive issues between Muslims and Christians. Uh, the uh, issue where there seem to be significant, and some people would argue, irreconcilable differences. Uh, my argument in, in, in that uh, article in, the, in this book is, is, is very simple, in fact, uh, and it goes, uh, you, can put it, you can put it very, very uh, succinctly. Um, everything which Muslims, on the basis of Quran, deny about the God as the Holy Trinity ought to be denied <laughs> by every Orthodox Christian. Indeed, has been denied by every normative Christian teacher. What uh, Quran denies about God as the Trinity has been denied by Augustine, hmm. has been denied by Aquinas, has been denied by Karl Barth, and so forth, right? Which is to say that 
in my judgment, I, I know that Muslims might disagree with this, but in my judgment, uh, in Quran, it is the wrongly understood conception of the Trinity that is being denied. Now, why, did, why do you have the wrongly understood conception of the Trinity? Well, because we Christians aren't that good in articulating mm. <laughs> the doctrine of the Trinity, mm. right? Mm. That may be a very good reason. And if I were going to go through our churches and pick out and, and, and come kind of through ethnographic research to a composite picture of how Christians in our pews understand the Trinity, I'm afraid that it would not be orthodox. <laughs> I'm afraid that it would be heterodox. I would, I'm afraid that Augustine would deny it, Aquinas would deny it. Mm -hmm. Every orthodox Christian ought to deny what many Christians believe about the Trinity. <laughs> uh, take, take the book that was so incredibly uh, popular, right? The Shack. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if you don't take it simply as literature, it's heresy. <laughs> right? It is heresy. Yeah, I read the book. I was moved by it. I think, uh, I think it has, a, has a very many significant redeeming features. But you have to read it as literature. You can't read it as theology. If you do, it is simply wrong. Uh, and in that sense, I think if we have a, a, a bit more if you want sophisticated understanding of the Trinity, I think we'd have uh, less difficulty. Now, I've talked with many Muslim friends. They're still not very happy with what I say, right? Uh, you know, they're not happy with the doctrine of the Trinity. And I can understand that, mm -hmm. but I think Christians will also have to affirm fundamental for the Christian faith, uh, non-negotiable for the Christian faith, is the divinity of Jesus Christ. It's on the count of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm that we affirm God as the Holy Trinity. Um, that is, has always been, and I think will continue to be, fundamental to the Christian faith. There are some Christians who do not embrace it, but overwhelmingly, normative Christianity has. And I think it reflects the character of God's self-revelation. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on this, on this issue between Muslims and Christians. But I don't think but much progress can be made. There is sufficient similarity even in that mm -hmm. very difficult area. And my, again, my, my please, don't just look at differences. Look at similarities as well. Make similarities matter and matter as much as differences do. And if you don't, you'd be like, like when I was growing up in a, um, in a, 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 a son of the Pentecostal a pastor in a dominantly, predominantly Catholic uh, Croatia at that time. We didn't pray in our church out loud Lord's Prayer. And when I asked, why don't we pray out loud Lord's Prayer? Uh, the answer was, Catholics do that. <laughs> now, so <laughs> just because we wanted sociologically, really, to be different than Catholics, we didn't pray the Lord's Prayer, which we clearly had a mandate from Jesus to pray. We can pray privately, we can pray publicly. We prayed it publicly, but because Catholics prayed it publicly, we wouldn't pray, right? Uh, that seems to me an uh, 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 absurd reason not to do something just because somebody from whom you're different does the same thing, even though it is a positive thing. I think the same is often true. Uh, and uh, let me add just this. Uh, in these discussions about the doctrine of the Trinity, especially in the discussions that raged around the publication of the Common Word document, uh, which claim that Muslims and Christians uh, are both committed to loving God and loving neighbor, then response of the many Christians was, I think, good response, good question, is God the same? And I think that was, that was a right question to ask. It ought to be embraced, it ought to be pursued. But then uh, they have, uh, Christians have said, well, Muslims deny that God has an associate. Christians believe that God has an associate. Since when Christians believe that God has an associate? The claim that God has an associate is not the denial of the doctrine of the Trinity. It cannot be because no Christian believes that. So I think we have to be really careful how we thread these things and differences. Um, and it, it takes a bit of sophistication 
about understanding of what it is that Christians believe and certainly not get ourselves into the position that we disbelieve something that other people say that we should believe. <laughs> right? We shouldn't have anybody from outside determine mm -hmm. negatively or positively what the content of beliefs is. Muslims shouldn't do that either. Christians shouldn't do that. It should come out of the center of our revelation. I'm trying to understand ultimately what the goal is. Mm -hmm. If we accept that Muslims and Christians worship the same God, how is that different from the types of struggles that the Anabaptists had with the, the Reformers mm -hmm. and the uh, Irish Catholics <laughs> with the Protestants in Northern Ireland? How do we get the, you know, how does it get any further than that? What ultimately are you hoping to accomplish with that premise? Uh, uh, it's, it's a very good question. So even if I were right, that there is a commonality. Muslims and Christians have a similar descriptions of God, the worship uh, in this sense, the same God. What good would it do as if differences between our understandings of God are the cause of our conflict? Um, I, it's, a very, it's a very good question, and not just because Christians fight among themselves, uh, Anabaptists and Catholics and, and Protestants uh, or, or whoever, but because I think most violence in the world actually happens in the living rooms between spouses who often have very close, they're exactly the same religion, right? The same branch of the same religion. So that's not necessarily the cause of violence. And I think it would be, it would be a very, it would be a mistaken understanding to think that the major cause of violence in the world is these differing conceptions of God. There are many other causes of violence uh, in the world. I think what, what I'm making, a claim that I'm making is, is a bit weaker than, than this, but nonetheless very, very important. And that is for monotheists, whatever the causes of violence are, agreement on moral issues, fundamental moral issues, would be very difficult if it turns out that they have incompatible conceptions of God. Right. Then you couldn't, the, the, your moral convictions, normally what happens in the, li in the living room, right? Your moral convictions are somehow served to curb, hopefully. If you let them kick in, they will serve to curb the violence that, you, that, that is being perpetrated, right? You're saying you are not supposed to be doing it, and we often do stuff that we're not supposed to be doing. The same, I think, might be true also between uh, different sects within the, within the given, uh, within the given uh, religion. Um, but if you don't have sufficiently common values, you can't appeal to this moral sense. And as it turns out, for Muslims and Christians, those common values are enshrined in their convictions about God. God regulates, pictures of God regulate what the content of our fundamental moral convictions are. Right? That's why the issue is important. It's not a solution to, to everything. It's a condition of possibility for discussion. <laughs> right? It doesn't resolve issues between us. It gives us tools and the framework, a moral universe within which those can be resolved. Uh, and often they aren't, because they aren't resolved between people who believe exactly the same things. Um, divorces happen, uh, wars and conflicts happen, and so forth, right? Um, Thank you, line. Professor Wolf. Um, you've kind of touched on my question a little bit already, but I guess I'm curious if we come to an understanding that Christians and Muslims are worshiping the same God, how should Christians then approach the Quran, um, assuming that we still think that the Bible is only special revelation? Is there something that we can be can gain that's not in the Bible that is in the Quran, or should we be reading it? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think we should be reading. Uh, we should be reading the, the Quran. I certainly I've read the Quran. Um, I have certainly also been enriched by Quran. I couldn't accept everything that is in Quran. And as a Christian, for me, um, uh, the revelation of God in Jesus Christ and in the Bible is ultimate. And it will serve always as a test 
for whatever wisdom comes might come from other, from other sources, from other religious, uh, religious sources. But that does not mean that I cannot learn something from the Quran and from uh, religiously something from Quran and Muslims. I'll give you an example. Uh, in American Christianity, we are now really fond of having this very intimate, almost buddy-like relationship with God. God is our Paul, God is here with us, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's all, uh, uh, you know, we were chumps. <laughs> uh, the transcendence, the fear of God, has in many instances been lost. Right? I don't think that's necessary. There is a gain in it, right? There's something to be gained in it, right? But the kind of sense of closeness of God, sense of intimacy with God, sense of unconditional love of God, but I think something is also lost. There's a long, long tradition in the Christian faith that uh, affirms the lordship precisely of that kind of God, not some other rogue God, right? who is a Lord and omnipotent, but the Lordship of the God who is unconditional love. We would do ourselves well if we would re uh, uh, rediscover that. Now, the sense of submission to God, the sense of awe before God that you have when you read, uh, read Quran and when you talk to, to Muslims, uh, often I have found it refreshing for myself. I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you other things. Uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, a person I consider to be a friend of mine. When I first met him, we spent a day discussing. He's a young Sufi, relatively young Sufi master. We spent a day discussing different spiritual things uh, together. Uh, you know, we're different. I'm a Christian, right? He's a Muslim, and that's what it states. At the end of our time together, he reached into his pocket and took his own prayer beads and said to me, Miroslav, during this course of this day, I have discovered in you a, a spiritual brother. I want you to have these prayer beads. I took those prayer beads, and I have often prayed with those prayer beads. I have prayed my Christian prayers. I have prayed Jesus' prayer <laughs> with them. Uh, I have designed my own prayers from the Bible with those prayer beads. But I can assure you, every single time I prayed, I prayed for Habibali also. And I think it has been a motivation to pray as well as motivation to more effectively show that which I think the God who died for all people, for salvation of all people, requires me to do in any case, which I haven't been doing on my own. Okay, my question is, in what ways do you see your proposal affecting Christian mission? And also, in what distinct practices of the Christian community are molded or should be molded by acknowledging what you propose? I think what should be pr primarily molded, um, the, 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 I, I think Christian practices are partly determined by the biblical revelation and they're partly determined by the, by the culture in which we find ourselves. Not all Christian practices are the same. It's a fusion of two. And the critical uh, question is, are they responsible to God's self-revelation in Jesus, in Jesus Christ? I, I think a more significant for me is um, recognition of commonality at the religious level between us. Um, it's, not a, it's not a complete parallel, but it's not too far also. Um, for long centuries, relationship between Christians and Jews has been very tense. And Christians have had a theology that in a sense justified those tense relationships. Uh, after the Holocaust, there came to a major reevaluation re just about in all churches, whether evangelical or, or more liberal, of the stance toward Jewish people and Jewish faith. And suddenly what we did then is we discovered Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was a first century Jew. The scripture of the Jewish people is our scripture. It's not an Old Testament kind of add-on that we can kind of discard. 
and so forth. What we have discovered in the way we have proceeded, we have identified commonalities. We haven't merged these two. By no means should there be any merger. Distinctness remains. But we have discovered commonalities and highlighted them as important. I think that's, in a sense, what I'm trying to do with the, uh, with the book on, uh, on Allah, Allah, Christian response, to highlight that there are significant commonalities. And I think that's simply in the function of seeing the other with the eye of love. I cannot be a follower of the crucified. I cannot be the follower of God who is love and not want to see the other with the eye of love. That is to see if I misconstrue them, if I portray them as worse than they are, I'm unjust to them, I'm unfaithful to my God. All prejudice is injustice. And there's no, there's no other way to think about it. Anytime I'm prejudicial, I'm unjust. As simple as that. I cannot be a follower of Christ, consistent follower of Christ, and do that. Now that's partly what drives this project. Partly drives the project precisely those most fundamental Christian convictions. God is love. Christ died for all people. I must love all people, even those who are my sworn enemies. And without love of enemy, I think you unravel the Christian faith. And you can't exempt some folks from this. We'd like to. I'd like to. <laughs> some people. <laughs> If I if it wasn't public, I'll tell you which ones I'd like to. <laughs> um, but I can. That's the scandal of the Christian faith. But I can't make it go away. I have to be faithfully expressing it, even though I sometimes fail in following it. Now, in terms of, in terms of the mission, um, I think it's a responsibility of Christians to witness to Jesus Christ. That is the fun, a fundamental response. Christian faith is a missionary faith. Mission, just like the Trinity, will not go out of the Christian faith. Ought not to go out of the Christian faith. I think what we need to do, and that's what I propose also in the, in the book, we ought to develop responsible ethics of witness. What we often don't do is we don't witness with respect. We don't witness in the way in which we want to be witnessed to. <laughs> Apply golden rule to the practice of witness, I'm completely on board with that. Then you have your, um, the last commission, right? And you have your golden rule. Once you merge the two, I think we'd be really, we'd be really great. We'll be doing really great. And you merge it partly by listening to the effects of your mission, of your witness, on other people. I have to take those into account. They matter. Why do they matter? Because Christ died for them. Because I need to love them. Therefore, it matters. Right? And then the mode of witness becomes the, becomes the content of the witness itself. And mode of witness cannot be in contradiction to the content of the, of the witness, because then you subvert with the way you do things that which you want to achieve by doing what you're doing. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. There's here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the... Um... As you started, um, the main concern that we were talking about here was uh, how we as Muslims and Christians live together in this world. And in support of that, um, one of the things, the main thing is the similarities. There are many similarities between Islam and uh, Christ Christianity. And I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in India and come, I'm a Christian. And, uh, but when I take that kind of rule, the, the problem that I do see is where do we then draw the line? in a sense like for a Buddhist coming along or even, even a Christian or somebody like John Hicks comes and says, well, Buddhism has made me better. Where do we actually say, well, it is a common good for peace we go forward to, but where do we say, well, that does not necessarily mean we have to compromise on or bracket certain beliefs that we hold close. So for example, for me, I was raised with Muslim friends, Hindu friends, Buddhist friends. Uh, at the same time, it was important for me to uh, it was important that my belief and my certain doctrinal belief are, uh, but my point was, so where is that point where we 
like, well, ultimately what I'm trying to ask is, is it possible to get to the same piece if there are no similarities? Uh, because then the quality, then die the death of a thousand qualifications, Buddhist comes along and says, well, we have similarity of nonviolence, or Hindu comes along with, and they put Jesus with other gods, as I've seen in my school. Where do we actually draw the line? We're like, okay, uh, so, it's so come. Two, two questions. One, well, what do you do when there are, dissim when there are no similarities, right? <laughs> where are uh, there similarities, yeah, but where do we no, draw the when line? When there are no similarities, that do, are, we, are we then destined to, to fight? Um, if there are absolutely no similarities in values between Islam and Christianity, I, I see very difficult, it would be very difficult to know how to make peace. But it seems to me so untrue to those faiths. I mean, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to construe Christian faith so that it fits something. Anybody who tries to design a picture of God for themselves so that it does some very important work in the world would be betraying God. God is not designed by us. It's the other way around, folks. God has designed us, right? <laughs> That's kind of the first and fundamental uh, conviction. Um, and so it's a question simply whether, whether, whether we have those, those similarities. And in cases when, uh, in what, if, what about atheists, right? Uh, who do not believe in God. Well, you look at, is there overlap in values? And my sense is, wherever you find overlap in values, you're happy. Why should I begrudge somebody thinking something that's true and practicing something that's good just because they're different than me. I celebrate that. That's great. More you believe as I think you should truly believe, the better it is for everyone. Uh, am I compromising by this? I don't think I am. I'm not trying to find the common denom uh, uh, lowest common denominator. I'm compromising with nothing of the Christian faith. If you've heard a single statement in what I've said tonight that compromises a single Christian belief, please call my attention to it. Uh, I embrace the Trinity fully, classical expression of it, divinity of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm near classical Protestant of Lutheran, Luther, young Luther stripe when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to uh, soteriology. Some of my Catholic friends think, yeah, it'd be better if you were closer to Muslims on this one. <laughs> um, so, I, 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 and, and so, so it's, it's partly because of my convictions, right, that I, I'm a Christian. I don't compromise on, on these things. But it's also counterproductive. I I probably what I was trying to say was there we limit ourselves. So in, even today you said, there are certain things you have to put in bracket. We won't touch that for the sake of the conversation because the mm -hmm. moment that comes up, it will raise issues that may not uh, help us reach to that piece or uh, work no, no. for that common I, good. I, I so that I'm... for me felt like, am I reserving myself? Do I, can I not still work for peace having those beliefs? Yes, mm -hmm. salvation through Jesus only. And is that a problem um, to work for a peace, to hold that and be open with it? Uh, to be able to work oh, with I, that I'm belief. I'm sorry if you understood me to I'm mean sorry. that I'm bracketing this from the conversation with Muslims. I'm bracketing this from my lecture tonight. Right? I'm, uh, I'm happy for you to ask me about salvation in Jesus Christ. I'm happy to say to everybody what I think about this. I don't think this issue ought to be bracketed at all. Uh, I think this issue ought to be squarely, Christians ought to say with as much integrity what they believe about death of the of Christ on the cross for salvation of whole humanity. This is the most, I'm a Christian because I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is what I live out of. <laughs> there wouldn't be me as a Christian without that. I don't want to bracket that. I want to give as beautiful and as plausible embracing witness to that as I can. Did I, am I talking too long? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Please. Okay. Um, as you said, certainly violence stems from more than religion, but some violence has stemmed from different convictions on how we are to worship. 
For instance, Christians struggle between different denominations and have violently oppressed one another and even refused community on the grounds of different worship practices. Will this difference between Christians and Muslims prove problematic for unity, or could it, um, if we recognize that we worship the same true God, lead to worshiping together? Will, if we say that we worship the same God, Worship would, the, the, the same true God. True God, yeah. The same true God, would that lead to worshiping together, right? That's what you're... Yeah, could it lead us it to lead worshiping to, together? Um, an example would be, yeah. if different denominations are often oppressing one another on different worship practices, you could argue um, they're not actually recognizing the true God in the same way that the Crusaders weren't, because they're putting something um, ahead of what God's command is. So if we are to recognize what God's um, common set of values is that he demands of us, will that possibly lead to worshiping together? Well, I think we, 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 might, we, we, we will align what we think is worship, true worship of God. Um, I think we will find then as Christians resonances with others who might similarly in this domain worship God. It's a different question, and it says, it's a, the other question, whether, whether we can, in the same worship house, mm -hmm. participate in the same liturgies. Uh, that, that's, that's, I think that's a different, different question. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm prepared to talk about that one too, but I want to make clear distinctions, uh, distinction between, the, and it's not the question whether Muslims can, wor uh, can use Christian churches and vice versa. It's the question about the common act of worship of God, uh, we'd, we'd have to discuss, parse out what it means. It's a complicated matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my, most of my question, is worship as a practice being differentiated from wor worship and liturgy. Yeah. Could similar values lead to similar liturgy in a sense almost? Um, it, uh, it, some aspect of liturgy. I mean, fund fundamental for, for Christian liturgy is to worship God through Jesus Christ, <laughs> right? Uh, that's a fundamental act of Christian worship, right? Because we approach God through Jesus Christ. We have standing before God through Jesus Christ. Um, I, I think we'd have to discuss that with Muslims to what degree that would be uh, appropriate. How, what modes of common worship might take, uh, given that that's a fundamental aspect of what Christians, Christians believe. I think I have exhausted you. <laughs> Thank you very much.